Salvadores del Mundo. Welcome to the World Changers Expat Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bowers, an expat who's lived the last third of his life in Costa Rica. This podcast consists of delightful, informative, and fun conversations with expats around the globe whose expat MO is to make our world a better place. Listen, and you just might be inspired to become a world changer expat yourself. Welcome to World Changers. Today we're having a conversation with Daniel Rosehill. Daniel is from the town of Cork in Ireland. He made his first visit to Israel at the age of 16 as part of the Birthright Program. About seven years later, he made his expat move and is currently living in Jerusalem. Daniel is a freelance tech writer and also has a blog and podcast on which he discusses tech issues as well as political goings-on in Israel and the rest of the world. So, without further ado, welcome Daniel to World Changers. Welcome, Daniel, to the World Changers podcast. Hi, Scott. Thank you very much for having me on. Great. Uh, you are. You have definitely set the record for my most long distance call. Distance call. I'm. We're we're talking from Costa Rica to uh, where are you at? Uh, so I'm based in Jerusalem, in Israel. Well, that's that's definitely uh, that definitely sets a record for world changers so far. <laughs> every, every, the magic, every, the magic yeah. of technology. Yeah, every interview I've done so far has been in Latin America, so I'm really uh, thrilled to have someone all the way across on the other side of the world. Um, well, let me start off like I do with all the guests, uh, asking for you to give me a little bit of background information. Um, you know, pre expat life in Israel what what where do you come from and um, you know tell us a little bit about who you are sure so um, I mean I actually did move about a small bit as a as a kid so I was actually born in Dublin so in Ireland for uh, people that uh, that aren't aware the capital city and we moved when I was a kid we moved actually over to uh, Scotland for a few years uh, my late dad was in the oil industry so I guess he moved there for his job um we actually i don't think i know we, we spoke uh we spoke for a few minutes previously so I, I didn't tell you some of this stuff but it's it's not it's not super exciting but i mean it's kind no, of no no let us know we, we need to know all about you <laughs> <laughs> i did one year we did one year in the netherlands which i was too young to remember mm -hmm. and then we moved back to ireland uh, and we moved to cork so i basically all my kind of memories are growing up in cork which is the second city in ireland in the south of the country so yeah, I grew up in Cork, you know, went to high school there, went to uh, university there, and then I moved to Israel in uh, 2015. So I've been here for uh, five and a half years. That's right. And, and you, you told me uh, during our previous conversation that you are Jewish, right? Right. So that's, I, I say there's only three reasons that people move to Israel. They're either Jewish, they're fleeing some kind of uh, prosecution, or they've gone crazy. So... I'm just uh, number one and a small bit of number three. Is that a little bit odd to, for a, an Irish a Jewish person? <laughs> I mean, most most people are Catholic and Irish. That just strikes me as being odd. Maybe I'm off. Right. I don't. Uh, I don't know. No, no, no. It's it's, it's fine. You pointed out because I'm currently going through something of an identity crisis. Because <laughs> uh, yes, as you, as you say, not not only is it probably the weirdest combination of ethnicities there is. So I, I've also had to kind of. Uh, <laughs> For, for medical, I had a medical just abdominal surgery a few months ago, so I've had to stop drinking for at least a few months. So now, now I, I'm not even a drinking Irish man. I'm just a uh, anomaly in all cultures. Well, that sucks. I, I hate to hear that for you because I know you miss your Guinness. <laughs> you get used to it. After five years in Israel, we make do with what we have. So, Although there, there actually is Guinness over here, but it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> we have Guinness here in Costa Rica, actually. Every, everyone, I, I love Guinness. Every once in a while, I'll pick one up. They're real expensive, but uh, they sure they, they sure are good. Okay, well, great. That's that's a good background. So let's get into a little bit about how you made it to Israel. What motivated the move, um, and how, how did you end up doing that? Sure. So um, I mean, I guess it, it's funny because one thing that changes when, when you when you move to Israel is now I'm living in kind of obviously to an extent a bubble. Um, I actually grew up, I mean, in Cork, we were like pretty much the only Jewish family uh, in the city. I mean, there were a couple more, and there's really a non-existing community. Not, I didn't have a single Jewish friend. The only Jewish people I knew were really my my family members. So that was uh, that was pretty weird. So that that was actually kind of largely the impetus. Uh, impetus. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I grew up there, and it was, you know, I always find it felt a little bit uh, strange being the only person, uh, the only Jewish person, and you know. Basically, that was so. Then I went on this trip to Israel, 
uh, which is called Birthright. And yeah. um, so that, that, was, that was my point about bubbles. Sorry, I didn't finish it because, uh -huh. uh, you know, you, you hear all these words a lot here and I realize most people haven't heard of them. So I did Birthright, which is like this trip where they bring people to Israel to like show it to them, whatever. Uh -huh. who, who, who is they? Who, who organizes these trips? So it's a philanthropic uh, organization, to the best of my knowledge, uh -huh. uh, funded by, I believe, a Canadian philanthropist. So, I mean, the idea is that people, you know, who maybe couldn't afford the trip are able to go. Uh, and it's, it's a really big initiative. But, you know, again, because Ireland being such a kind of off the beaten track place in the Jewish world, I kind of went with a uh, group out of the UK uh, via Belgium. And that was my first uh, experience here. So I, I, that was when I was about 16. So are these people all over the world that are taking advantage of this uh, program? Or is it just Europe or? <clears throat> yeah, no, it, it, it's a worldwide thing. But you know, when it comes to the Jewish world, so it, it always tends to be very heavily slanted towards Americans. So I see these groups now, and they're mostly, you know, containing American visitors. Are they mostly young people that are doing this or are all ages? Uh, yeah, I think there, I think there's an age cut off, but they also organize uh, older, you know, different programs for let's say older people who want to check it out as well. Is the is the motivation or the the idea behind it is to actually encourage people to? I mean, here in Costa Rica we have the expat tours. I, I actually do those myself, and there's some other groups that do that kind of thing that encourage people to actually come and live here. Is that the same thing that this birthright program is doing? Is encouraging people to live uh, to migrate to Jews to migrate back to to Israel, or is it just to let them have an experience of the country? That's actually a great question, and uh, I'm not sure that the answer is so clear-cut, because um, I think it's to give people the experience and maybe the idea that they, it will kick off some kind of a process, but I don't remember it being, you know, getting, like, propaganda about you should move here when I was here, to put it like that, so I think they just showed us, showed us around the place. Okay. All right, cool. And now, did you make the decision to move as a as a uh, because of that program, or did that come later? What give us a little bit of history behind that? It, it was it was kind of this awkward awkward thing because I mean I'd gone on this program. I did actually another short trip for learning the language, and uh, it was kind of a good. And when you say the language, because, is that is that Hebrew? Yeah, the, yeah, they speak they speak okay. Hebrew. So I did okay. like a summer course uh, after finishing high school here as well. So. It was a good and a bad thing because the the bad thing was that it's I don't know if uh, probably other expats can relate to this, but once you kind of get the idea to move somewhere, it kind of nagged at me. So um, I'm not sure if I had had not done this trip whether I would have ever actually come here. Uh, but once I had come, and as as I said, it was a lot from from my personal reason of uh, you know seeing that there was a place where I wouldn't be like kind of a weird as you, as you as you said there you know an Irish Catholic. It's just like a weird it's a weird fit. So um, I, after that point, it was kind of always on my mind. Uh -huh. And then it took a few years. I did college and, uh, you know, and worked for a bit. And and then I made the move. So, uh, but it was kind of always in the back of my head since I, since I took that trip. So you were, I believe you were 16 at the time, right? Right, right, exactly. And what, 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 uh, what age were you when you finally made the actual move? I was 25. So yeah, there was, there was a bit of time. I looked at coming here when I was 19 uh, and I've, you know, ultimately decided against that, um, and then yeah, came at twenty five. Okay. Do you have a family? Are you married? Or are you just a single guy there? No, I so I, I I got married last year. So my wife is from America, so we're I'm from American, from America. So we're oh. really uh, we're really an expat uh, couple. Okay. And uh, but no, besides that, I don't have any family here, which I think is uh, actually I've come to appreciate over time just how difficult that is. And I, I, I think that goes not for Israel, but for any, anybody in an expat situation, I, I've come to appreciate, you know, the advantage of stuff like family and having network of friends in a country. Uh -huh. uh, so no, no, we don't really, don't really have that. Did she come on the uh, birthright program too? or she, for other, other um, she did, but she's actually been here longer than me for oh, okay. uh, about two years. <clears throat> yeah. So that's a, that, a lot of people get there that way, I guess. It must be a pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty large program, right? Yeah, well, that's that's uh, interesting. So, how? What are you doing now? What are you What are you doing to make a living there? So, what I do is um, basically writing. So, I uh, write for. There's a lot of uh, technology companies here. There's a lot of technology companies in the world, of course. But uh, so, I was working in uh, marketing communications for uh, a number of years, both here and before um, I made Alian. That's that's the one piece of jargon I want to explain. That just means. 
moving to Israel, it's a Hebrew word, Aliyah. So before I did that, I also worked in the in the field, uh, relatively briefly. I'm only I'm only 31, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So now, I've, for since two years ago, I've been basically doing this uh, full time. So I guess you could call me. I try not to use the word uh, freelancer, but you could call me independent, self-employed, however you want to put it. Right. What kind of challenges are there in, in being an expat and making a living in Israel? I know that's a big topic here in Costa Rica. People come here and, and um, think it's going to be easy, but if they don't have a pension or some kind of built-in income when they get here, they find out real quick that it's not that easy. What's what's your situation been like? I would say it's the exact same situation. It's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's really really tough. I mean, both the you know there is there are definitely positives to the job market here. There's a lot of good PR or, you know, positive PR coming out about the Israeli uh, high tech scene, which means just, you know, computers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily translate in my experience. And I think in a lot of people's experience to being you have to remember that this is like uh, Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an English speaking country. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I'm in kind of a challenging position of uh, being in English, writing in English. And that's really my thing is writing and marketing communications. Uh, it, it definitely for me it makes the local market challenging when people don't always really understand the value of that um, so but that's something I see you know I speak to a lot of guys you know uh, 20 30 years older than me mm -hmm. uh, who kind of find a lot of the same challenges here trying to convert their old careers into Israel and it's uh, to be honest it's just a, it's a huge amount of work I work very very hard and uh, I would like to, you know, cut cut down a little bit, but yeah, it's 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 a challenge here for sure. But is is is, is English? I mean, you say English is not widely spoken there. I would think that it would be, but it's not. Is that what you're saying? Right. No. No. It's it it, it is widely spoken. Um. But you know, ultimately, the companies here work in Hebrew, and I think my Hebrew now is at a pretty professional level. But uh, that's, you that's know, great. Ulti ultimately, you're you are in the Middle East. Mm. And you're not in America, and uh, it, it's different, you know. Did you, are you just self-taught? You take classes? How'd you how'd you come along with yours? That's even learning a new alphabet and everything, isn't it? Yeah, there is. It's a different alphabet. So yeah, mm. it's. I mean, it's it's definitely challenging. There is, as you say, there's Hebrew, and of course the um, the all the tax stuff needs to be done through Hebrew. Uh, so I kind of didn't really. I didn't have the traditional path of going to a Jewish mm. school because again, it was a city of. Essentially, no, with, with no Jewish community. So, yeah, I did kind of pick it up from the internet, and I think that's uh, partially why I, I just love the internet because, oh yeah, uh, you know, if if it weren't for this is back in the day when the computer, the screens were like these crazy boxes, uh, that, that's kind of how I just get information. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that got me started, and uh, I just kind of improve slowly here. Yeah, well, I've got 20 years in Costa Rica, and I still people ask me if I'm fluent, and I, I tell them. I don't think I'll ever be fluent. <laughs> I think I don't. Uh, you know, I've, I have met very few people that that had to learn a, a different language in another country that are fluent. You know, I, if I'd you grew exactly, up, if you grew up with exactly. a parent or something like that, that's different. But man, if you if you migrated to another country and you're trying to learn the language, the chance of you ever being fluent are very <laughs> unless you're just super at, at languages. And I'm not. Right. My wife yeah, does I, not I, speak English, English at all, so that helps me a lot of practice. <clears throat> I, th I think the same thing. I think pe I also wouldn't describe my Hebrew as fluent. I use that word professional. You yeah, know, to mean yeah. That I can w send work emails yeah. and communicate with people. Yeah. People use the word. I have to say, people throw away, throw around the word fluent very liberally here. Yep, yep. Uh, yep. So I, I, I have a high standard, and as I, I tend to agree with you that it's, it's probably unlikely that I'll ever achieve that kind of native level. Right. Uh, but you know, it, it bothers me less than it did. To be honest, I'm happy with yep. me too, learning me. a few more words yep. each day, and yep. uh, you know, you, you, you kind of make, make a funny gestures with your hands if you need to and people understand you somehow so yeah it makes it life out. makes life interesting makes it more of an adventure <laughs> yeah. For sure. yeah sure what what is the uh situation with covid there how's how are things getting along uh I, w I would i would love to tell you but uh i'm on a news blackout scott so um no i mean it's it's from what i understand my, my what does that mean what does that mean you're on a news blackout that that means that uh, I got overwhelmed by the COVID news, and I a few oh, months ago I tried so to. Oh, so you completely limit, backed but, away uh, from it. Yeah, that's, that's healthy. <laughs> so, I mean, it's 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 impossible to escape. And my my mom tells me that the uh, situation is bad. The numbers are so they they did very good on the first wave. Yeah, we did too. And, um, mm -hmm. The second they opened it up too quickly, and now it's uh, coming back with a vengeance. And the hospitals are. 
achieve it you know they're already reaching their capacity i think over 100 percent in the in the ward so um I've, I've just been trying to i've been living like kind of a sort of semi hermit the last three months uh mostly occupying my home office where i'm speaking to you from and uh you know, keep it, keeping up with uh, the world through Facebook and this kind of thing. But it's 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 a weird situation here. It was good, and then it went it went south pretty quickly. So that's kind of where it is now. That sounds exactly like Costa Rica. What's the population there? Uh, it's about eight million people, give or take. Okay, you're you're you're, you're larger than us. We're we're a little over five million. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were being touted as one of the the country's best, you know, this handled it the best in the world. I mean, they were comparing us with New Zealand and New Zealand and but then June happened and all hell broke loose and you know and it's just been awful since June the cases have been going up 500 600 a day. Um wow. Not where I live, uh but in the in the more densely populated part of the country around the uh, capital. So yeah, yeah, it uh uh, yeah, I'd love to see an end to this thing because it, it's no fun. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's I think that's the hardest part is there is no, there is no sort of end around the horizon. So to keep to keep motivated and to keep optimistic is uh, is a challenge right now. To, I think that we all have to, you know, work on. Well, how is the expat life in Israel? What what is, is there? A, a, I would imagine there's quite a mix, a cosmopolitan mix of different nationalities that are living there, right? Or what's what's it right? Like? So. It is so. I was, def- was definitely more involved in it in the first uh, few years I was here. As I, uh, as I said when we spoke last week, um, there is a huge amount of Americans. There is some, uh, a few lesser Canadians. There's a big uh, amount of Russian people here. A lot of Ethiopians. Basically, wherever there's uh, big Jewish communities is, you know, basically that's where the people are coming from uh, who moved to Israel. Mm-hmm. So. Those are the countries. So, I mean, if you're an English speaker, probably your your initial friends are, are going to be Americans. Um, okay. And, yeah. Oh, aren't there a lot of Europeans? Um, there are French people. There are some Brits. Um, very few Irish. I, I really, I've only met two. Um, and, yeah, that's, I'm sure, I'm sure there's other ones I'm skipping over, but it's it's quite, as you said, American dominated. You're in Jerusalem, right? Right, I, I I am in Jerusalem. Now that's that's uh I would imagine that's a pretty highly touristic location to live. A lot of tourism there, right? Uh yeah, there is, and actually at the moment it's uh it's really being cut back. So we went to the Dead Sea last week, and there was like you know virtually no tourists. So um, it, it is. I mean, Jerusalem is uh, what Israel, you know, it's in dispute basically because the Palestinians want East Jerusalem, and it's it's a let's say politically contentious issue, but it's Israel's claimed capital or what Israel asserts as its capital. Um, and But despite that fact, it's not really where all the jobs essentially, you know, 90% of the private sector jobs would really be in Tel Aviv in that area. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, Jerusalem's actually a poor city, uh, believe it or not, because there's just so many ultra religious Jews here who are typically in, you know, let's say not the higher socioeconomic classes, there's uh, Arab Palestinians that are also relatively uh, poor in East Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. So Jerusalem's actually a weird, because you're, you're, you're right, it is, a, uh, it is, of course, a tourist hotspot, but uh, it's a strange mix between being the capital and not really feeling like when you go to Tel Aviv, you get much more of a feeling of skyscrapers and development, and Jerusalem is kind of a, by comparison, still a bit of a uh, dusty, dusty town. What's the population there, roughly, Jerusalem? Jerusalem is uh, almost one million people. It's like nine hundred thousand, okay. approximately. Okay, and Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, you've uh, caught you've you've caught me off guard. I think about one point two, and they're in. Sorry, Jerusalem. Uh, Tel Aviv's actually less. I think I believe it's oh, eight okay. to nine hundred thousand. But when you take the Tel Aviv extends up and down the coast. Uh, it, they call it in Hebrew the Merkaz, which means the center. So, uh, it, when you take the kind of cities next to it, it actually exceeds Jerusalem. So. Um, it's re- that's that's really the population center of the country is around Tel Aviv. Well, what is your take on the political situation there? I know that's got to be something you deal with on a day to day basis, or do you? Yeah, I, I I do, and that's another thing. So I'm uh, I'm constantly uh, evolving in my approach to uh, to let's say mental wellness and how to what to, what to stop looking at on Twitter and what to look at on Twitter. So this week actually I said Twitter. 
Twitter is is not a good place for me. I don't find Twitter I don't find Twitter very uh, enjoyable. So mm. uh, I I say that because I was tweeting a lot about the various goings on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there's I mean there's at the moment there's a lot of protests against uh, the government actually, but I don't really see likely that anything's going to come of those. Um, I mean yeah, the, the, it, it is a very political place. Um, I'm I'm not very optimistic about it. The uh, Tuesday process has been going nowhere for a very long time. Uh, the U.S. administration, the Trump administration, has rolled out what they call the deal of the century, and that's trying to, um, you know, basically, in my opinion, I think a lot of people would feel the same thing, uh, give the Palestinians a bad deal. And then Israel, before the, actually during the pandemic, was talking about uh, annexation move of the Jordan Valley. So there is a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I don't really, I don't really see much of it as being in a positive direction. So. Uh, yes, it's a politically charged place. Uh, Israel is uh, drifting further to the right, further, more nationalistic uh, as time goes on, it seems to me. But as I said, at the moment, there are there is a uh, protest movement happening and a lot of social unrest. So it'll be interesting to see what happens as a result of that, if, if anything. Well, Net- Netanyahu, he just got reelected, did he? He did. He, there was a uh, stalemate for like a year and... Uh, Ultimately, they formed a unity government, but the government doesn't seem to. You kind of get the impression they don't they don't like each other very much. The parties that came together in it, so uh, there is a lot of speculation that will collapse pretty soon. How about the just the safety issues? Does it create danger for you in Jerusalem to have all that going on around you? So yeah, I mean Jerusalem is where you'll have more uh, attacks. So there that's, was a that's wave. what I, I was think, here, Yeah. Right, right. I was here for a wave of knife attacks actually, but. Um, overall, Israel is actually quite safe. I mean, I'm, it you know it's, it sounds a bit uh, suspicious maybe, but the statistics for a crime are actually very low. So you don't have much crime here. Mm-hmm. Um, you do, of course, have uh, nationalistically motivated uh, attacks taking place, but uh, it hasn't really had a major impact on my on my experience living here. But then again, I haven't been here through a, a major war, so. Uh, easy to easy to say, I guess. What are your future p- plans, Daniel? Are you going to stay there? You think you? You, maybe I know I'm not leaving in Costa Rica. <laughs> what are you? What are you? What are you gonna do? You gonna stick around or not? I think it's very right. I think I think it's stressful. So I from when I came here, I took the approach of I, I remember like deleting my uh, my Facebook, and LinkedIn, and starting from scratch in Hebrew. To, uh, my idea was that this was like a permanent move and to integrate to the maximum possible extent. And uh, I've just come to. It, think and appreciate over time that I think that kind of thinking is stressful. I know it's different for different people, but um, at the moment, I'm undecided and, uh, you know, I like to be open about it. I think before I felt that everybody in my circle of friends was, you know, 100% positive and not that I'm trying to be 100% negative, but uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging Israel to live in. I've recorded, uh, uh, written my own blog about this and, you know, there's a lot of things living here that you don't necessarily see as visitors. The cost of living is probably the biggest uh, issue I encounter here to a big extent. It's very expensive, and uh, the salaries can sometimes be less than the West. Mm-hmm. So that dynamic creates a lot of pressure for people. So um, hard to say. I, I, I probably right now, to be honest with you, see more uh, opportunity outside of Israel. Um, and it, it really depends. It's kind of strange to have your life uh, not determined, but to an extent determined by the political unrest. So. I'm hoping there will be some change because I see that the government uh, has become quite corrupt and uh, very, very much out of touch with the reality of people living here. So if there's some optimistic moves, it would encourage me to stay um, for a longer period of time. But I'm I'm not in the process anymore of uh, making indefinite statements. Again, we we don't have children uh, at the moment, so it's maybe, again, easy for me to say, but... I find that just takes takes off the stress of uh, because sometimes when you are in somewhere like Israel or wherever your expat listeners are located, it can be, you know, if you kind of pack your bags and say that's it, uh, if things go wrong there, it's uh, it can be it can put you in a stressful stressful position. What is your blog? My blog is uh, DanielRosel.co.il. It's quite a it's uh, it's just about te- a lot of posts about technology and Linux, which are you know things I'm interested in. But there's uh, there's some stuff up there also about uh, uh, Ireland and Israel. So DanielRosel2Ls.com. You can actually go to .com and it forwards on to the 
uh, Israeli website. So okay, uh, so yeah, just Daniel Rose, DanielRoseHill.com. That's easy to sure. remember, easy to remember. And you also do a podcast, right? Or, or not? Yes, I was I was not I was not going to mention my podcast because I thought that might be uh, that might be a little bit rude. But uh, no, I, for sure. <laughs> yeah, what is it? I've done a uh, I've done a few episodes. It's just a passion project. So what what I do for my writing is I I basically ghostwrite. So I'm you know writing stuff for technology companies and marketing teams and mm-hmm. you know they typically brand themselves so uh, i it, yeah it's i just started this blog and this podcast as uh just my own way to actually say you know explain who i am and what i do for the for anyone interested so so your uh, yes, your, your it, podcast anyway. is also danielroso.com that's yeah there's there's a link to it on the blog or you can just type into google daniel rose Hill podcast and uh fantastic. you'll find it on spotify and all the usual places fantastic and i'll put a link to both in the uh, uh podcast show notes so true uh, appreciate, appreciate that absolutely absolutely okay great i always like to ask a closing question we've come to that moment in the interview uh about how living as an expat i mean the way i view it is i'm kind of on, on the outside looking in and it's drastically changed my perspective of the world um living as an expat and i just wonder what's your views on that how have you how has your perspective of the world changed being an expat from Ireland living in Israel, I love I I, I I love that I love I love that sentiment, Scott. So actually, that um, that's pretty much how I'm feeling now. So you know, I told you about the uh, <laughs> stomach surgery as, as as kind of a joke about being an Irish man that that uh, isn't drinking alcohol right now. But it's uh, that is actually kind of you know it it summarizes kind of how I feel right now. I don't uh, I've definitely lost a lot of connection to Ireland. I still have very fond memories of it. Um, at the same time, out, an outsider looking in uh, describes, I think, the experience here. So there's kind of this uh, feeling or, you know, people who move here because they're Jewish like me think that it's kind of maybe as they brand it that you're automatically welcomed in. And I think that to a large extent, Israel isn't actually any more welcoming of immigrants than uh, Mexico is of Japanese people. <laughs> um, there's kind of that, there's kind of is this feeling of being an outsider, no matter how hard you try to learn the language, to befriend locals. It's a different experience. So uh, this is going to sound like the most cliche, ridiculous thing you've ever heard, but uh, I, I feel like a citizen of the world right now. I feel yep. like yep. my I feel like my growth continues linearly. So if I if I were to move back to Ireland or move to Japan, I'd like to just keep uh, you know either doing what I'm doing or changing things. But I, I wouldn't, I would never view my time here as a waste. Uh, but I don't particularly feel very uh, connected right now to uh, honestly, I'd almost say any country. I have a strong, strong Irish identity still. Um, but yeah, I kind, I actually kind of am optimistic, and that's how actually how I discovered your podcast, searching for expat podcast, because I just you know decided I wanted to hear from other expats to just start kind of challenging myself of like, you know, are there other places I haven't thought about? So maybe it's uh, Costa Rica. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Well, I'm glad you found my podcast and it's been delightful to interview you. And uh, I wish you well uh, in Israel and whatever you plan to do in the future. Yeah, likewise, Scott. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay. Bye-bye.